So, Seamus, what's up with nerds these days? What's going on? All right. Here's something I did not think we'd... Here is something I was very doubtful. You know, sometimes YouTube brings you something and you're like, yeah, right. So... I don't want to watch bonsai tree trimming. What? Oh, that guy's actually really good at that. Wow, 12 hours wow. later. Right? <laughs> you subscribed to his channel and bought some of his merch. <laughs> Got your own bonsai tree on the way. Uh, uh. But, like, I see an hour-long presentation on text files. And I'm like... Come on, there's no way. But it's got 200,000 views. So I'm like, all right, how could 200,000 people be interested in somebody talking for an hour on text files? And sure enough, it's really good. Uh, a guy named Dylan Beatty, uh, I think I said his name right, who incidentally has a voice scarily similar to the late Total Biscuit. Like, same accent and very similar inflection. Hmm. And that no relation same to Roy Batty, I hope. No. But that same emphatic delivery, like, when Total Biscuit would be like, this is the most outrageous thing, in the, and it would be like, you know, they nerfed Warlocks in the latest WoW patch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he's like, you know, really into... And this guy is a similar delivery talking about text files. Anyway, this this video, which I will link in the show notes, is quite a trip. And I thought there was no way I was going to learn anything, but I I did. Um Fascinating. for instance, for instance, why if you, if you've been a programmer for any time, maybe you've run into the problem where uh on Windows, lines end with control feed and um, a carriage return. And on Linux, it's just a line feed. Now, I've always thought that the Linux way was superior. There's just one symbol saying, hey, go to the next line. Right. And, and I was always really just confused. Why did the makers of Windows, which in this case, of course, this goes all the way back to DOS, why did they waste an extra character on the end of line? Like, if you have a text file, the end of every line is actually two characters instead of just one. And it's, it's actually, it, like, before DOS, right? This goes back to teletype, even. Yep. So I didn't know this, but apparently you do. Uh, yeah, the, the reason there were two different characters was on teletype machines, you know, like, line feed moves the paper down to the next line. Carriage return just returns the cursor to the beginning of the line. And you might want to do a carriage <laughs> yes. return without doing a line feed and then type the exact same characters again. And that's how you did bold back in the Stone Age. <laughs> and uh, Linux had device drivers back in the day and knew what kind of device it was talking to and didn't need to like send both of those but windows well dos was just sort of like yeah whatever i will not bother to differentiate between the possible devices i'm talking to i'll just send the same crap you know it just sort of like sloppily made everything the same which of course has caused about 30 years of headaches every time you bring in a text file from from uh Linux, it, you know, you share code with somebody, you download a Linux file and you open it up in your, in your word processor on Windows and everything's crammed, you know, no line breaks. Yeah. And it's just this annoyance. It's just this constant annoyance. And, or if you forget that there are these two characters you have to, have to handle, or you'll make a, a parser that won't, runs on one platform and not on the other. It's just dumb. Well, I, this talk explained that and ASCII, and how it developed into Unicode, and all the ways things went horribly wrong over the years as people just tried to sit, share simple text files. Hmm. That sounds lovely. It, I'm going to have to listen to that. Yeah, it's a great talk. And it, it really is like listening to the ghost of Total Biscuit. It was for me. So what about you? What have you been up to this week? Well, uh, Invisible Ink went on sale, and so I bought a copy of that. It'd been on my wish list, and uh, played a bit of it, and it's good fun. 
tell me, I, I think I played this game. I might own it, but tell me about it because I am hazy on the details. Steam says you've played it before, but uh, yeah, it's an uh, isometric, um, kind of three-quarter top-down strategy stealth game. Uh, you you sneak around hacking into stuff and stealing secrets and trying to get out without people noticing you. Ah, uh, yes. I last played it April 2016. So, um, yeah. It's been around a while. Very, yeah, I have very hazy memories of this now that I see the art. I remember really liking the art, but the gameplay did not grab me. I don't remember mm. why. We got a comment... Uh, sometime in the past saying, oh, you guys might like this, or it has interesting mechanics, or maybe it was a good stealth game or something. I, I forget what the recommendation was, but I put it on my wish list and, uh, and now I've been playing it a bit. Uh, the kids have been playing it too. It's it's not super deep, um, and maybe that's the, the drawback is it's you can kind of understand what's going on pretty quickly. There are some optimizations you can make about uh, you do this thing before that thing, or you know, handing items off and doing tricky stuff, but so far now I haven't gotten very far. I've only gotten to like level two levels, but uh, so far it hasn't been particularly challenging in terms of mechanics. Interesting. That art style, though. Yeah, it's very very stylish. It's kind of an Art Deco y. It's a gigabyte. That's pretty big for an indie game. I know, right? What's with all these games? They're so huge. Oh, we've already done this a million times. What about you? You can play anything? Right. Um. I rage quit V Rising. You might remember I played that last week. Yeah, yes. Oh, that game, it finally pissed me off. I actually wrote a rant, which I'm thinking of posting next week. I might wait until I might wait until Rocketeer is done with his um series before I actually post it, just so the week doesn't get too crowded. I'm not sure. Also, I didn't take any screenshots, and I might go back and get screenshots. But this is, this is like the <laughs> most irritating, uh, most irritated I've been with the game since like my early days with um, No Man's Sky. Oh wow! Just, just sort of like flabbergasted at the design. A very similar pro. Like this is a great looking game. And I love the idea of it. Playing as a vampire, it's full of good ideas. And that, like I said last week, it's got this cool thing where you hide from the sun during the day, you know, and it uses the real shadows. So, yeah. you know, if you stand in the shadow of a tree, you'll you'll be okay. But the, the sun moves now, it, during the day. I have a technical question. Is it using, like, 2D sprites? No, this game's 3D. Okay, okay. So it's, it's got like a shadow map, or is it doing ray tracing? How does it actually make the shadows? I'm sure shadow map. I, I believe the game's made in Unity. Okay, yeah. Um, the game... Okay, I will, I will give you the short version of the rant. Okay, spoilers for the rant for two weeks from now. Right, right. Okay, so you, you, you get power by getting better gear. And you get gear by getting recipes. And you get recipes by doing quests. Well, and by fighting bosses, right? So, like, you, you're you always at the level cap, essentially. It's like, I can't get any more power until I do the next quest. That's how this game works. Like, there is no, oh boy, I can't beat this boss. I got to go grind for a few levels so I'll be stronger. There's no grinding for any more power. You do the quest. That's how you get your power. So, okay. the leveling mechanic is just, like, how many quests have you done? Yes. And they're in, it's not just how many, it's they are in this order. It gives you one thing to do, and you do that one thing, and then you get another thing. So there's like, okay, there are no character classes. Everybody's character evolves in the same way. You go through the same armor. You have to get every, you know, oh, man. it's, you know, I'll be wearing the bone armor, and then the reinforced bone armor, and then the copper armor, or whatever it's called. It's like everybody goes through the same gear and the same progression it's just the same i can see how that would really really annoy you it's like taking you right back to grade school right there's just no room for it like in grade school i remember getting bored and like just this work is so boring i'll like do the problems in reverse or every third one or just anything to not do the tasks in this in this static order just because it's such a numbing thing and you're just looking for it. But this game does not allow you to do that. Ah, so, worse than grade school. 
Wow. Right? So it gives me it gives me a quest. It's like go out and and entrancel somebody, you know, hypnotize them with your vampire powers and bring them back to your castle. All right, so I do that. And this is a bit of a pain in the ass. You've got to get somebody weak enough, and then, you know, you can't be in combat, or it's, and then you've got to lead them all the way back to your base, and they can be killed along the way. So it takes a few tries to, like, get it all right. And once I get them back, you stuff them in a coffin. That's how you turn them into a, a vampire. Stuff them in... Okay. I thought I just had to bite them, but I... I no, if you bite them, they'll just die. <laughs> So you shove them in a coffin, and then you wait, like, a, a real-world hour. <laughs> wow. Coffin aged. Which, right. And that's, like, I don't know, a few days in-game. But, like, a real hour. So, like, there's nothing to do. Like, you can't progress on your quest until you do this. And it's like, okay, this is taking an hour. And I'm like, well, uh, it's not like I can go side questing. It's not like I can go grind <laughs> right. for levels. or like, like, you made a game where there's one track and then you put a roadblock in front of the track. What were you thinking? What am I supposed to do? I <laughs> guess a, I'm supposed to run around a store a PvP. where you can buy, like, extra energy or something to speed it up? No. Uh, but anyway. So it's like, okay. So I, my my slave my archer lady or whatever she is pops out of the coffin she's now a vampire and it's like okay order your minion to go on a quest to, to go like i can send them on missions and they'll bring me back resources well this is kind of dumb because it's like i don't need resources i've got more i've got chests full of every resource in the game i'm swimming in resources I don't need resources. I need the next thing in my quest chain. That's what I need. That's the only thing. That's the only thing that makes me more powerful. So gathering up more bones and plant fibers and uh, copper ingots doesn't do me any good. Who cares? But fine. That's that's the next quest. That's what I've got to do. All right. How do I give her orders? Oh, I've got to I've got to sit on a throne. Okay. Well, how do I build a throne? Oh, I need I need it. it Okay, this is just one item. It just says, give her, you know, sit on a throne and give her orders. All right, well, I need iron ingots. So then I spend basically an entire play session, play session wandering around the world trying to find iron ingots. And I finally find an iron mine. It's like, oh, such and such iron mine. And I go in the front door, and there's a bad guy who's got, like, a skull beside his name. The game's way of saying, this guy's <laughs> no. too high level. And not only is he too strong for me, but he's got an entourage. And they're just, there's enough of them that they would be too strong with me, even if he wasn't there. Oh, no. And in fact, he catches me and I can't even get away. He just, boom, kills me right in the, right out the gate. So this is like the butler to the iron mine? I get, I mean, he's, he's a, an elite and he wanders around the mine or whatever, or the area. I don't know. So then I go back and I look all over. So then I search for a few more hours and I just can't find any other. I, I thought the game was saying, hey, this is not where you're supposed to be. This may, you know, don't go here, kid. You, you are not tall enough to, for this ride. Go somewhere <laughs> yeah. else. So I look all over the world. Don't find any iron. Finally give up. Enraged. Look online. Nope, you're supposed to go to this mine. So you are forced. You are... I'm power capped. I can't get more power. And the only way to get more power is to get past a guy that is to get into a place that's guarded by a guy who is definitively signaled according to the game's own language as being too much for me. But I guess you're supposed to sneak by him. So I sneak by him and then there's another boss past him just inside. Now she's a bit weaker and I can fight her, but she's a real handful. And I just mean barely beat her and i'm like stagger away from the fight back away and then the big guy comes in and from behind and i'm all weak low on health and he just one shots me wow what fun this is so fun i love being an immortal vampire i feel so powerful so after a bunch of dicking around i eventually sneak in and get some iron ingot or get some iron ore get back to my base but wait i don't have the recipe to make iron ingot. Now, oh no. If my vampire was a friggin' genius, maybe he'd figure out that the plan here is to shove these iron is this iron ore into the same fucking machine you use for copper ore, dumbass. But no, that's <laughs> that's apparently that's you need to be some kind of galaxy brain to come to that. 
conclusion. So I look up, and you can you can look within the game. It tells you how you get um, recipes. It's like a meta recipe. Yeah, well, no, you look through the list of bosses, and it tells you ahead of time what you will get for defeating a boss. So I look down through the list of bosses, and I find a boss that says, this guy knows how to make iron ingots. Fine. March all the way across the world. It is a long freaking hike. Get there. In fact, it takes like a day, more than a day. Like I have to just stop halfway and wait for the sun to go down again. And I finally get to his front door and I can't open it because you need explosives. So then I'm going to turn around and what? go all the way home. And of course that takes a day and a half and look up another boss and say, how do I make explosives and find another boss that knows the um recipe for explosive and so i go and i fight that boss and he's a real handful and i wish i could build up more power so that you know he wouldn't be so close you know i'd like to overpower him but no it's just i'm just barely strong enough to fight him and i beat him and i get home and i realize oh you're supposed to use an alchemy table which i don't have so i get to fight another boss this is still the first this is just one item on my fucking to-do list <laughs> build a chair to sit in so I could tell my idiot minion to go get me some to go get me some loot that I don't need. Some iron ingots, maybe. Right. <laughs> so I finally I go out and I find out I, I find another boss. And they're an even bigger badass. And they're even more of a pain in the ass. And I beat them. And I get the alchemy table. And I come back. And I build explosives. And then I go on the huge hike across the world. Blow open the door. Fight this guy through this guy's giant doom fortress. Fight this absolutely outrageously difficult boss. To learn the recipe for iron ingots. Come home. Finally smelt my iron ingots. Build myself a throne. Sit on it and discover that the minion of recruited isn't strong enough to do any of the available quests. Seg fault, blue screen of death, game over. There are just not enough swear words to convey my absolute blazing hot contempt for this game. It's apparently mutual. Right, like this game is open world, but there's no freedom. So the open world is oxymoronic. There's only one thing you can do, but it doesn't even tell you what the one thing you can do is. You've got to go find it. You've got to go searching in the open world for the one thing you're supposed to be doing. It is... <laughs> Needle in the haystack open world design. Right. This is terrible design that has no flexibility, no creativity. Oh, I hate this friggin' game. Oh, I hate it. Oh. <sighs> Very angry. I've gotten myself worked up again. I, I, I hand the floor off to you, Paul. I need to cool off. Okay, well, um, speaking of rays of light, um, there's a really cool browser ray tracer that I uh, heard about, and it's very fun to play with and pretty. Tantalum. I opened this up, and I was like, how cool could a browser-based ray tracer be? It's really cool. It's got, what, one, two, three, four different lenses. This is 2D. And you click and drag this light source around, and then it simulates the light source going through all of these lenses, doing refraction and bending. And yeah, like you said, it is just very beautiful. I find it like very soothing. I wish you, I wish it could do real time. Put some music on, chill out. This is really good. And there are there are another six scenes that you can play with, and uh, another four types of light sources. And you can also adjust the spectrum of the light. It's it's a it's a real joy. Oh, I didn't even see the changing scenes. Oh, that's cool. Oh, I'm, I'm caught up playing it. This is just so fun. <laughs> well, that's the show, folks. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I played with it a bit. I was showing the kids. You turn it on to laser and go to the prism and show them how to make a rainbow and and you yeah, know, I, the double reflection and all that stuff. It's I, it's really yeah. Fun. I just found the Pink Floyd one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah can do total internal reflection the thing i love about it is that it's not just like a simple like pure refractive or pure reflective like it does both so you get the multiple reflections and it refracts the light at different wavelengths different amounts and so you get the chromatic dispersion and it's it's a really it's a really neat playground to play with optics it is so speaking of a playground i see you've been playing surviving mars 
All right, now we get into the fun game. This is what I turned to when I rage quit V Rising. I opened up Steam, opened up a wish list, and looked for the first thing I could find that was on sale. You know, it's kind of like you, you you have a bad breakup with somebody, and you just dive into your old. You just call up a random X. I don't care. <laughs> First one that's on sale? <laughs> First one that's available. That's right. Um, Surviving Mars is super charming. It is uh, it is like a city builder. It's top down. This isn't like um, Planet Crafter that we talked about a couple weeks ago. This is uh, more of a wide, you know, you, you're looking top down. You're the manager of this place and not just one guy on foot. Um, hmm. And it's not like... Like the whole Mars thing. It's not like Per Aspera where it's you're trying to like terraform the whole Mars. You're just like working on a like a city sized chunk of Mars. Right. And you even um I mean you you build in domes. You don't terraform anything. You just live on Mars. Nice. So um the the convention with these games is that you just experiment with them right you fire up the game and you just start building crap and you see how things work you know if you're building a city game it's like oh i didn't build enough fire departments and or oh crime's getting out of control because i didn't build a police station or oh i didn't build a highway connection so nobody can get through here but like i just find it extra funny doing this with a mars trip the idea that you would get to Mars and nobody has a plan. Yeah. I've got like $18 billion and I'm not sure what to spend it on. And I'm just imagining this administrator like scratching his chin going, so what do we need first? <laughs> like just doesn't know. <laughs> he looks at the astronauts. What is it exactly you do here? <laughs> Would you say you're essential? <laughs> Speaking of your personnel, so you actually have to build with robots for a bit. You you build like a seed place and you build housing before you send your first astronauts, which I, I love that. That's really cool. And the game is actually, the game actually does not treat people as disposable. Like you have to build housing for them and a way for them to make their own food and, you know, and water and... You know, and electricity and everything, and then you get your first batch batch of colonists, and then they have to survive for ten months, and they all got to survive before you're allowed to have any more. They don't send you more people if they're just gonna die on your godforsaken base, <laughs> rust ball. But the one thing I found really weird is okay. So the first time I'm finally ready to to invite people to Mars. So I open up the, you know, the colonists selection thing, and I've got my list of a hundred or so applicants. First guy, top of the list. This is the person at the top of the list. Leroy Presley, a youth. I didn't even notice he was a youth when, when, I, when I saw him. Okay, so this is somebody who's not yet 18, who is an alcoholic gambler hypochondriac. Uh. <laughs> that's, that's our guy. Really, I'd like, I go through this list of people and like half of them are hypochondriacs or cowards. And I'm like, come on, we're, we're not hiring people to work at McDonald's. This is a Mars mission. But like half the people don't even have degrees. Like some of them are like, <laughs> some of them, okay, this guy's a botanist. This woman's a geologist. This person's a scientist. This person, no spe specialization. I'm like, come on. We're really going to send somebody to Mars and they don't have any worthwhile education? Like, why would you do that? It costs so much to send a person to Mars. You would want to make sure that person is the healthiest, most stablest person. Like, I should not be seeing a list of hypochondriacs, alcoholics, and gamblers. It should be like, do I want... This super well-adjusted person, or this super genius, or this Olympian. It's it's literally the joke from Portal 2 about, like, yeah. we are hired all these <laughs> Olympians and stuff, and then we just threw them away. Only it's, like, flipped upside down. It's like, we got all these guys bums off the street, and we sent them to Mars to build a colony. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, this is just ridiculous. Like, like sort of dumpster diving oh wait here's somebody with no major drawbacks or neuroses 
I, it looks like they might be able to survive. Did they forget to sort the list, perhaps? R right. Wait, is this the bottom hundred people? And you've got like the better, <laughs> you've got like another hundred people that are all better than these. Oh, sorted worst to best. I see the problem. Right. Oh, and then, uh, and then, you know, about 10 months after the colony is founded and everything, one of my colonists dies. And I'm like, oh, shit, what did I do wrong? And look, he died of old age. <laughs> like, really? You sent a geriatric guy to Mars? Nobody thought this was strange? <laughs> this guy's on his last legs, and we hurled him across the universe so he could die of old age on the surface of Mars. At least he got to do scientist shit for like 10 months before he dropped dead. Oh, man. That's going to you know, be Elon Musk, right? He's, he's finally going to get to Mars, and he's going to die of old age. <laughs> I just can't believe it. So, and the... the first man on Mars that I told you about, that's a youth. That's a young person. I think that's somebody not old enough to work. So, like, your list of applicants is this minefield of people that, like, a lot of them are too young to work, and a lot of them are so old they're gonna die next month. <laughs> and you've got, like, and then the rest are just alcoholic gamblers. <laughs> it's like, what? What is this? What is this ridiculous thing? How, where are we recruiting people from? <laughs> Turns out it's like a penal colony and not a... Not, <laughs> they, they got it mixed up with another kind of colony. The one other thing that I thought was kind of ridiculous was um, you can have dust storms and they break your equipment. All right. Um, and, you know, they break your water pipe and your water begins leaking all over the place. Or they bring, break your oxygen pipe and your oxygen begins leaking out. This makes sense. Hmm, okay. Um, and then it broke my electricity cable, and my electricity began leaking out. <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah, my electricity. It's like, oh, uh, you are now, you know, when your cables is broken, you are now looting, you are now losing 24 units of electricity per soul. And I'm like, wait, losing electricity? What's it going on the ground? <laughs> Can I get somebody to go out there and scoop it up and put it back in the generator? <laughs> get a glass jar, the lightning in a bottle. Right? How is this? Did we not, did we come all the way to Mars and nobody brought a fuse? We don't have any fuses up here. Circuit breakers? No? Nobody? No circuit breakers? Nobody? You didn't bring an electrician, that's the problem. You gotta, gotta check that box. <laughs> Forgot the electricity, instead we brought this alcoholic hypochondriac that's underage. I don't know how we get an underage hi alcoholic onto Mars. Like, that didn't set off any... Hey, this person's 16 and he's an alcoholic. Is that, we're just going to send him to... Uh, we're send him to Mars? That, no red flags there? Great. He must be from Germany. <laughs> Germany. <laughs> so it's a, it's a really fun game. I mean, I've, I've, I've spent... A lot of time making fun of its logic but i i really had a good time with it it is kind of silly i would like to see the people i i think you ought to choose between you know great and better people and not like sort have to sort through all these losers like i'm never going to send a hypochondriac alcoholic to mars that's just irresponsible <laughs> i'm not gonna do it so like it's just silly <laughs> wow yeah it feels kind of like uh, oxygen not included, where you but you're supposed to be like printing out, like three D printing these replicants or something, and they're all like right. little sideways, and there are problems with them. But like, if the conceit of it is is that you're trying to build a colony, like, and this is the first, it's the first, is it like the first colony on Mars, or is this like someone's done this yeah. before? This is the first. This isn't like a high school project that someone's trying to pull together. <laughs> Right, no, this isn't like 200 years in the future and like, you know, some clubs trying to trying to go to Mars too now that the governments and all the big corporations have do it. No, this is the first manned mission to Mars. The first Mars colony. Ah, yeah, they, they got to they gotta work on their, um, what is it, ludonarrative dissonance, I think. Right. Like, I understand for gameplay purposes, they wanted you to have to, to weigh, you know, to like consider the qualities of each applicant but i think having people with like serious problems like i would consider alcoholism a serious but well and then i would have a question of wait a minute how is alcoholism a problem at all 
Who is making alcohol on Mars? <laughs> right. <laughs> We've got a, a closed ecosystem. Like we're we're rationing everything. Where's where, they've got a still in their bedroom? Right. Well, like where's this alcohol? Like, and it says, oh, they they you know they have these disadvantages. So if it, evidently it factors in. So not only do we send alcoholics to Mars, but we also have alcohol on Mars. And I just. I think that this whole part of the game could have been thought through a little better. I would rather, yeah, be deciding between the between the super genius and the Olympian rather than, you know, people that couldn't get a job at Burger King. Oh, man. Well, that sounds fun anyway. I have seen Surviving Mars has come up on my recommended list several times, and I always pass it over because it looked a little bit too much like those Anno games. Um, it, it didn't feel like it was a, really a sim so much as like a you know connect the the tinker toys kind of game but I, maybe it's uh maybe it's better than it looked i would say it's better it's not uh super deep although you know i feel like i built this thriving mars colony and i'm only halfway up the tech tree and it kind of hints that there's some sort of mystery that you eventually get to solve so i don't know maybe i'm only scratching the surface <laughs> of the game so what do you say i guess i guess we'll do some mailbags yeah we got some time left Hi, Diecasters. I think we're all familiar with the ways threats to children can be used to jumpstart pathos and fiction, and the ways it can be misused, as with the brute force or over-the-top usage in Prey 2006, and the infamous Some Kid of Mass Effect 3. Seamus, I thought one of your effective criticisms of the latter case was that the kid was conjured up out of nowhere as an obvious cipher without build-up, characterization, etc. So my question is, what do you think, what do you think of the famous slash infamous Dead Island reveal trailer as it keys into this topic? Uh, it remains very well received artistically, similarly introduces a kid with no characterization. Do you think the Dead Island trailer is just a uh, more slick application of the same effect? Or might it operate at a different scale because it's a trailer and trailers are definitively low on characterization? Thanks, David F. Elrod Sr. Thank you, David. I'm probably not the best person to ask about this because I am so sensitive about it. Like, there's that indie game, That Dragon Cancer, which is about, you know, a parent caring for their child who has cancer. And I can't get near that game. I heard somebody talking about the game and it was freaking me out. I think it was Chris Franklin. Like, I couldn't even, like, stand to watch his review of it. It's just very upsetting for me to see children hurt. Um, I can't handle it. So I might not be the best person to ask about this because I'm going to be super conservative. <laughs> like just, you know, I lean so far away from the kids being hurt. It stops being entertainment for me. And I, I gather a lot of people don't care. You know, it's just, hey, it's another person. It's just as valid as anybody else getting hurt. Um, But the Dead Island trailer, yeah, it operates on a difference. Do you remember the Dead Island trailer? Paul? I don't think I watched it. Um, the Dead Island trailer is infamous because it has a very somber, it has sad piano music. And what it does is it's half the trailer is forward, is played forward, and half of it's played in reverse. But if you watch it all forward, it is a mom and a dad and their two little girls on vacation in a hotel, but they're being tried chased into their room by zombies and just before they close the door the little daughter gets bit so then they pull the daughter into the room because of course they do they're not going to shove their own daughter out into the hall they pull their daughter out and, and they get the door barred and they just barely get the zombies held back but then in the middle of the fight the daughter's already up and zombified and bites the dad and it just you know the whole thing basically that moment where they pull their daughter into the room killed them all and it's obvious there's mm -hmm. nothing else they could do you know no parent is just gonna like oh well there's one of my kids <laughs> um so it was just this oh it had to happen this way but oh it's so tragic and part of the trailer is played in reverse so you're not sure what you're seeing so it starts off on this the face of this zombified little girl and then it like you follow her backwards and you see oh oh there she's attacking a guy oh that guy's her father oh oh that's how this happened that's how we got here mm. so and then once you put it all together at the end it's just a real gut punch but yeah it's not asking me to like base my entire 
emotional engagement on three games on this little girl. It's just, hey, your emotional engagement on this two minute vignette in this little girl on this little girl. So that's like, yeah, totally different scale. Um, but the joke with the trailer is that this has nothing to do with the video game. Dead Island. <laughs> oh. Dead Island when you actually okay, it has this incredibly somber thing. Everybody thought, whoa, this is gonna be like some really heavy duty story, some severe pathos, you know, who am I gonna meet? And then you get in and the story is just like lazy comedy nonsense. Is is this the one where you use like cash money to repair weapons and things? Yep. Yep. That's the one. Okay. It's uh the opening cutscene. It has references to like some memes, some old, some memes that were quite past their sell-by date by the time the game came out. Oh no. Uh, if you remember the guy saying, hide your kids, hide your wife, Anton Dodson, uh -huh. there's some guy, like there's references to that in the opening cutscene of this game. And the cu opening cutscene of the game is you go on a drunken bender and then pass out. And then when you wake up, the zombies have happened. There's no family. So is it like Ono oh zombies or is it like lol zombies? Uh, the game can't decide. You meet some people and they're like, oh, my brother, I had to kill my own brother. And it's like zooming in on there. If you've ever seen the Bethesda game where somebody's emoting, but the camera pulls in real close on their emotionless face while they're while the voice <laughs> actor is crying their eyes out right Just hamming it up uh, yeah and so that's half the game and then the other half of the game is like you wander into a bungalow and there's some chick it's like oh man i'm out of champagne i need more champagne i love champagne will you go get me champagne and that's a quest and she'll give you a bunch of money that you can use to repair your golf club if you find her champagne. <laughs> Just rub it on the golf club there and straighten it out. Right, right. Like that. But that trailer paired with that gameplay is just, just, mwah, just the most dissonant thing you could possibly make. It's perfection. It is perfectly stupid. So, so, okay, to, to overview, like the, the trailer was an effective piece of pathos, but yes, it wasn't effective because it didn't connect with the game. Right, it had nothing to do with the game. It's like having this heart-wrenching, you know, imagine this heart-wrenching uh, trailer that really, that really gets you going. You know, it's like something you'd see for Schindler's List or whatever. But then you go to the theater and it's an Adam Sandler movie. Right. That is dead. Oh, no. And, and also, even though you're very sensitive to children in peril, uh, Watching the trailer wasn't a, so much of a problem because it wasn't something that you were actively engaged with. It was just something you were watching. Right, and it was short. It was short. If it had been like, if this was a kid that I got to know over the course of a movie, I, and I realized, oh, this kid's going to die at the end of this movie. No, back button. Let's watch something else. Hmm. So like four minutes, you can hang for that. Right. All right. Dear Diecasters, while listening to old episodes... I heard Seamus self-identify as a perfectionist. How does this trait square with being a programmer? Is Paul a perfectionist too? With scanning distance of perfectly, Chris P. Thank you, Chris. Um, clarification, I'm only a perfectionist about, about some things. About some things with code. Some games I'm perfectionist, like um, right now I'm playing Surviving Mars, and I'm, I feel this need to pack all the buildings as close together as possible. You can build all sprawled out all over the place, but I like doing this maximally compact base where there are no free... You play on a hex grid, and where every tile has something useful in it. But other games, mm. I, I don't have that compulsion. And I've never figured out why some things trigger my perfectionism and some things do not. It's it's a great mystery with me. With code, I know what triggers it. It's when I was young, I was a sloppy coder, and you come back to your sloppy code later, and you feel regret, and you're like, I can't make sense of this. And so you learn the lesson, you know, and every time that happens to you, you're like, well, I need to be really careful. And you come back to your code later, and it, and you were very careful when you built it, and it's really good and readable, and you can use it again. That feels incredible. So, oh yeah, it's nothing like it. So that's yeah, building a building a, a complex tool that is that you can come back to and be like, wow, this is really good. Who wrote this? Oh, I wrote this. Oh, 
I get um I get war a warm feeling when I'm scrolling through the code and I'll see a big block of comments that I knew this is part of the code is really doing something kind of weird or unexpected and I knew it was so I wrote a note for myself and here it is thank you me from the past or I draw a really common when you're doing proc gen stuff is to draw a diagram hey here's how these polygons are laid out or here's how this breaks down mm, yeah yeah I guess when it uh, when I feel like there's gonna be a payback right like if if it's just something a throwaway you know, tool or whatever, then I'm not a perfectionist. It just needs to work, and it it doesn't have to be optimized. It just has to get done, you know, sometime today, you know, right. that kind of thing. It's like, eh, fine, whatever. Like I don't, I don't really care. So it's not like a compulsive perfectionism, but uh, but there's certainly like a an ideal of like, hey, if I'm going to be using this, and like other people can be using this every day or or something like that, then I really want this to be as good as it can be because. Like every error in this is going to be compounded a hundredfold or, or whatever and, and cause, you know, that much headache to everybody. So, yeah, sometimes it's worth it. Sometimes it's worth it and you don't do it anyway. And then you feel regret. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not even sure when it started creeping into my video game playing. It actually interferes with my enjoyment of some games. If I get too fussy and obsess too much, I'll end up just starting. I'm like, oh. I didn't, especially like strategy games, I lost too many units. I don't, I'm not happy with this layout. I could do this more optimally. And then I, you know, started off more optimally, but then I learned even more and I realized I could build it even better. And so I end up playing the first hour of the game 10 times and then I just get sick of it and quit without exploring the rest of the game because I'm just oh, no. too much of a perfectionist. I've had quite a few strategy games like Dead End because of because of my need to optimize. I I optimized out like I didn't optimize out the fun. I just optimized instead of having fun. Mm. I don't have that in shooters. It's not like, oh, I got hurt. I should reload and do that more perfect. But in strategy games, I have that all the time. I lost too many units in that exchange. I should reload and do it better. Or I should start the level over and try a different approach. I have a kind of a similar um, perfectionism when I'm doing 3D modeling, where I want the geometry to all be procedural so that I can change anything in the in the modeling chain at any time, you know, forward and backward, and have all the geometry optimized so there aren't any wasted vertices in the middle of faces and things like that, and, you know, get everything all clean and, and oriented, and every, every object is named, and they're all in the correct hierarchy, and, like, because I know that if I ever want to use this again, it's going to be great, because I'll just be able to, you know, change this or change that, or, or reuse this part, or, you know, move things around, and it'll be really easy to, to manipulate later. And um, and that can be really fun if you're working on a project and you come back to it a bunch of times, but it can be um, really detrimental if I'm doing like a commission and I'm never gonna use this model ever again and the client is just gonna 3D print it so they don't need to change anything. And I'm just right. like wasting my time optimizing all this stuff because I feel the need to make this clean geometry. And it's like, why am I doing this? Like, no one cares. No one cares about this output. So. Uh, yeah, it can it can be a, a hindrance if it's like if you feel compelled to make something better than it needs to be And it seems like you know, you want to do the best job you can at all times, but that's really not true like they're, they're trade-offs Yeah Dear diecast. I'm not much of what you might call a racing slash driving gamer But there are a few I've played and really enjoyed and I'd like to branch out into the genre some more Recently, I've got into Distance, and it's largely been fun. So I was wondering if there are any racing or driving games that you really liked, what you liked or disliked about them and the game uh, and the genre, and if there are any on Steam that you'd recommend. Kind regards, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. So, yeah, Distance is at the very top of my list there, because it's not racing. I'm not crazy about racing against AI cars. I like the feeling of racing you know, driving very fast in a cool looking location in a cool looking vehicle. That's fun. But racing against other cars is like stressful. And I never, because so many games use rubber banding, 
when I win, I don't feel like I win. I feel like it let me win. And when I lose, I don't feel like I lost. I feel like it cheated. Because both are true. It let you win or it cheated. Like, that's, it's always like putting its thumb on one side of the scale or the other. Oh, I'm too far ahead. I better start sucking. Oh, wait, I'm, I'm too far behind. I better start cheating. And so you're never playing against like a fair opponent. And so the whole thing feels arbitrary. And if you built an AI that like was driving perfectly, then it would be impossible to beat. And then it's just a matter right. of, well, like how stupid is the AI that I'm that I'm driving against? And that's not really any fun either. It's like, well, it's kind of letting me win on that side too. Right. And the one the other problem is like in a video game you're often overcoming enemies, right? Like you kick in the door, some bad guys, you shoot them, you win move on to the next room but in or you know it's okay fight and then you know you 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 karate kick them to death right and sure. 30 seconds later it's over but in a racing game that the size of an encounter is the size of an entire race so that's like you know 10 15 minutes instead of five you know a shooter an encounter is 10 seconds and in a fighting game an encounter is you know 15 20 seconds and in a racing game it's 10 minutes mm. and that's too much at stake it's like i yeah that you just don't get the feeling of overcome unless you have one of those really arcadey racers where you're just sort of like the old pole position where you're just sort of like always passing opponents right <laughs> like there's just this mm -hmm. arbitrary like Opponents all over the track evenly distributed and you just continually pass them But <laughs> they're being generated in front of you and they just like explode behind you <laughs> Right exactly like that one. I guess if you just sort of Accept that that's sort of like just speeding on the highway. You're just always passing people But the race where everybody starts at the same time and you drive for 10 minutes and then you win or lose is a very binary outcome to a very long encounter and that doesn't work for me so i don't generally like racing games because yeah binary outcome long encounter time well and there's and also those... like the real hardcore racing games that are like nascar simulators where a race oh, yeah. is like literally eight hours and you got to have like a water bottle with you so you can like play the whole thing the le mans it's 24 hours. I've seen people do that. People just do those 24-hour races. I mean, those games you can pause, though. But still, right. 24 hours in for one race. That's just crazy. Um, there was another racing game that I didn't buy. I was waiting for it to go on sale, and instead it left Steam. Hmm. It was called Blur. And it was basically like a Mario type. Okay, imagine a Mario type game, Mario Kart type game, where you get power ups and you throw stuff at other cars and you make them spin out. Except it looks more like a Forza game. You know, it's like slick, mm -hmm. photorealistic graphic. And it had a really cool, like, the soundtrack to the game was just like basically the soundtrack. I used for programming. It was like all electronic stuff that I was already into. Huh. So I was like, I was like, oh, and it had this really cool, like lots of bloom lighting and bright, vibrant colors, and the pickups were these glowing neon things. So it had like this Tron feel, and the cars looked real sexy. And I played the demo. And I'm like, man, I'm getting this when it's on sale. I'm not going to buy it now. I'm not going to buy it for full price because, like I said, I'm, I'm not one for racing games. But, yeah, when this is on sale, I'm going to buy it. And then it went off of Steam. What happened is the game flopped, and then they needed to pay more to continue to license the music. And they were like, this game sold so poorly, it's not worth it. So you cannot buy it. If you already own it, you're fine. But if you do not already own the game then you cannot buy it on Steam. Weird. Blur. And I am sad. It's one of those one of the few games that I regret not getting. It's weird that the license wouldn't be like per copy. Right? It's right. Very weird. And I've seen other I've seen other deals that worked like that. I think Rockstar they um 
licensed a bunch of music for um, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. And then at some point those license lapsed and it was going to cost more to renew them. And they were like, uh, don't bother, we'll just patch them out. And so instead of taking the game off of Steam, they took the music out of the game. And of course the music they got taken out was all the best music. Like all the stuff that was really, really popular there in 92 when the game takes place. And so one day, you know, Steam updates your game and all of a sudden half your soundtrack is gone. So weird. Seems like that, that shouldn't is, be allowed, but... It shouldn't be allowed, especially not for Rockstar. I mean, Rockstar has so much money. The fact that they would, like, whine <laughs> about having to pay this. Like, you guys make billions, billions of dollars. And what what are we talking about here? A couple hundred thousand maybe a million. This is peanuts to you. Peanuts. You're basically demat. Like, can you imagine George Lucas going back and removing scenes from his old movies? Just like chop them out, like take bits of the soundtrack out. Like no artist would do that to their own work. Like how lacking in artistic integrity do you have to be to like, ah, screw it. I would rather butcher my own art than pay a little bit of money that is trivial to me. Like Rockstar, I know the big companies like are just soulless, amoral corporations, but Rockstar is like a parody of that. Well, speaking of butchering the intended experience, what about playing GTA as a racing slash driving game? Man, I hate when I'm playing GTA and I go to a quest and like, oh, I wonder what this job is. Oh, it's a racing miss. Damn it! And you get a race. The races in GTA are terrible. They really, really rubber band. So, like, you show up with a terrible car, you'll win anyway. You show up with the best car in the world, you'll just barely win. Because they cheat their ass off. It's really, it's really blatant. So, what it really is, is the don't crash into anything. That That's, <laughs> that's the real goal. The other drivers do not matter. You are not racing them. You are trying not to crash. If you... Oh, I caught a mailbox, spun out a little bit, went on the sidewalk, got back on the road, but now everybody passed me because I made that tiny mistake. Oh, I guess I'll do the entire race again because I ran into a mailbox on the last turn. Oh, awful, awful missions. So just distance then. Fuel? Fuel was just, pretty good. I mean, it's not available anymore, but... Right. Fuel was good, but it's barely... A, I mean, it is a racing game, but it's you know, more a great terrain simulator. <laughs> hmm. Fuel was fun. Distance is fun. Have you played any of the Just... long haul trucker games? I, yeah. Um, I did play, I played Euro truck simulator and I really enjoyed it. And then I saw American truck simulator got bad reviews and I stayed away. And then they came out with a patch. I, I think initially at launch, American truck simulator was like the America was real small. I mean, the game already, the game already <laughs> like shrinks it down, but it like shrunk sure. it down to where it's like, you can't even call this Rhode Island truck simulator. Like this is just too small to pretend it's America and you're just missing too much. And it just didn't feel good. That That's what I heard from people. But then I heard they patched it and people were saying it was much better. So I don't know. It's sort of been on my... Maybe I should check that out one of these days, but I haven't done it. I haven't done so yet. It really seems like that should be a slider in the options menu. Like, how big do you want your America in this game? <laughs> how big do you want your America? I love it. I want my America supersized. <laughs> the size of Jupiter. You make it bigger and it just makes it bigger by adding more McDonald's along the roads. So just like miles and miles of McDonald's one after the other. Shoulder to shoulder. Man, I was going to say, it feels like driving through uh, Kansas or South Dakota is like somebody turned the slider up for houses the size of America. You got a lot of McDonald's out there then? <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's billboards. What is the place? I can't remember the name of the place, but there's like a billboard every mile for this place and it offers free water or whatever. And so it's just like free water at this place. Free water. Hey, stop here and get some free water. Like, guys, no one is being convinced by every billboard. Like, why did you do this? Free water? What kind of that? Are you having a water shortage there in Nebraska? Who's tantalized by free water? Like, water's always free. 
Who Maybe the billboards were water? from before it was required to give out free water. Maybe. I don't know. It seems like water's been free my whole life. You just go to a restaurant and say, I'll have water. They don't charge you anything. It's like, hey, free paper cup. They didn't charge me for the cup. There's got to be a half <laughs> cent of parts and labor in this. They gave it to me for nothing. Just the $2 I paid them for the potato. <laughs> the half a potato I ate. That's right. It's pretty cheap. It turns out water's not very expensive. Right? I mean, I could understand Unless you're on that Mars. Sign, right? <laughs> I could understand if you're in California. Hey, free water. Actually, that would be dangerous. Everybody would come and get all your free water. Somebody shows up with, like, a tanker truck. Yeah, I heard you got free water. <laughs> this guy's just driving around in his truck. Hey, uh, you guys want some free water? Come on in the... Come on and get in the van. <laughs> <laughs> Send you to Mars. That's where all the Mars recruits came from. They tricked into getting in a van somewhere in SoCal. They get off the rocket blinking, you know, the sudden light in their face. Like, ah, somebody promised me free water? <laughs> well, and that's probably also why you can't get any uh, good recruits in V Rising. Well, I feel like we've done a show. Thanks to everybody who, thanks to everybody, well, the three of you who sent in questions this week. If you've got a question for the show, our email is diecast at SeamusYoung.com. Yeah, we thanked you out the mailbag again. Again! We're good at this. We're good at podcasting. Is that what we're doing? Yeah, we're talented. I'm telling you. We're, we're so talented, we should go to Mars. <laughs> we could definitely make the cut. <laughs>